She's cheating on you, you know that. While I was still thinking about it, Missy set my coffee down next to my heaped hash browns, smoothed her apron. All sounds from the eatery appeared to recede. Her big blue eyes were fixated on me when I lifted my head from my phone. How did you know that? she asked. She furrowed her elfin brow and shrugged. Call it women's intuition. But really, it takes one to know one. There was not an ounce of melancholy or regret in her scratchy voice as she admitted to being an unfaithful partner. She had never sincerely shown regret for her treachery. Still, animosity was non-existent. It was that particular detail that piqued my interest and was probably the most uncomfortable part of it. I don't think she meant any harm to me, Caroline, or my marriage. Worse yet, her announcement failed to shock or amaze me. Earlier there had been a hint, first subtle, now more apparent, that Caroline's previous business visits were about more than just work. Missy was only telling the truth as she saw it. I've seen you here with her, and I can just sense it. I know. It's none of my business. But I don't want to see you hurt again. Ah. <sighs> An unconscious grin spread across my face. She spoke with an unexpectedly upbeat tone, saying, I know. It's a bit hypocritical coming from me. Considering I'm a bit of a wild one with the morals of an alley cat, I wouldn't say. Yes, you would. You did say that. Those were your exact words after you tossed cash out the window. Missy gave a grin. After giving it some more thinking, I see it was correct. That was something I had already stated. I feel bad about that. Regarding what you said? Her expression was one of near offense. No, for throwing cash out the window like that. I forgot we were on the second floor. With her blonde pixie cut pushed back, she faked relief by wiping her forehead. Thank goodness. I don't want you chickening out on me. Besides, what you said was true. Still is. I enjoy fooling around. I probably should have thought about that when you proposed. We were so naive when we were younger that we didn't understand Missy wasn't really the settling down type. Damn fortunate. I realized that before we tied the knot. Our realization, or more precisely, my discovery of a man in my bed with my ostensibly exclusive girlfriend, had a price and Robert Cash Monet had paid it. Upon my entrance, Cash swung around and sprang at me, completely oblivious to the fact that she was engaged to or living with me. He might have avoided a broken nose, two broken arms, and a broken arm by having a short chat. Despite my skepticism that anyone actually believed me when I said he was attacking my girlfriend, I was able to get out of there by convincing everyone that he was actually trying to get my girlfriend out of his office. Whenever things start to take on the tone of a Jerry Springer show, the authorities normally would prefer that they just disappear. The first excitement rapidly fades. Me too, she said with a nod. That would have been a disaster. I mean, what if we had moved to a higher floor? Poor Cash. I nodded, and we both laughed as we remembered Missy's expression of utter disbelief as we gazed out the window. Yeah, he didn't deserve that. Just when the prosecutor was about to lose faith in Cash, his memory suddenly got fuzzy once he grasped the context. Even after his embarrassing flight attempt, Cash ended up being one of my best pals. For an instant, she froze. Well, I gotta get back to my other customers. Are you sure, Missy? She looked down at her toes for an instant, while my speech sounded calm and solemn. Yeah, I mean, I've got no proof, but yeah. I can feel it. But why would you trust me? You've got nothing to gain from it. A fake frown was her expression. I guess you do trust me. I'm alone with your food a lot. Is that why it always tastes like cinnamon? I had teased Missy for years about her love of cinnamon gum. Her look changed from clever to sympathetic as she started to respond. You don't seem surprised. Something's been off for a while. Even when she's home, she's just not really there. Are you having an argument? No. 
were not really conversing much at all. That's worse, you know. Missy had always been approachable and insightful, even though she occasionally disregarded her own guidance, making her a strange choice for a relationship counselor. She's leaving her wedding rings at home when she travels. I found them in her jewelry box, at least the last two times. Her brow furrowed as she said, Well, damn, that's probably not good. That's what I thought. You should ask Cash to look into that. He does that whole detective thing. He's an insurance investigator, Missy. He's not a cop. She clenched her jaw. Pretty much the same thing. Even has some kind of pie license. He can do the computer thing. He knows how to look into things, do you? No, not really. Cash had access to a plethora of databases, and his strength was in finding specific information. I'll drop by Cash's today. You might be right. She smiled enigmatically at me. I usually am. But when I'm wrong, I'm very, very wrong. From behind his desk, Cash lifted an eyebrow and gave me a quick look. How sure are you? I don't know. It's not like I'm an expert here. His brow arched slightly. I'd think you'd have some ideas. I mean, it's not like it's the first time it's happened. Prick. Well, we at least know you've got a pattern. Cluelessness. Wow. Glad I'm getting sympathy here. He laughed. Hey, I'm going to help you all I can. At least it won't be me getting thrown out of a window this time. Jesus, how many times I gotta say I'm sorry about that? Money smiled. I'll let you know when you reach it. Did you get some stuff together? Like I asked when you called? Here's Caroline's schedule for the last six months. The schedule for the next three months, cell phone bills, and all the credit card info. I handed him the folder. You on all of these? Not her business credit card. I probably won't be able to do anything with that one. I don't mind helping you out, but I'm not risking my license over this. Don't worry, though. If something's going on, I'll likely be able to figure it out. Most people aren't as clever as they think. He moved the documents. You know this won't fix things, right? Yeah, I know. And you know it won't matter for anything in divorce court, right? Yeah. Yeah. I just want to be sure. I'm hoping I'm wrong. I don't want to blow things up without some kind of proof. But the way things are, if I confront her and I'm wrong, I might as well plan on a divorce anyway. You think you can fix it? Depends on what's really wrong. If she's done with us, I'm done. Maybe I'm misreading all this, and she just has issues she doesn't know how to talk about. Cash gave me the impression that he didn't think much of me when he shrugged and said, Yeah, I'll investigate it. Just give me a couple of days to figure it out. Seriously, if she's got problems, I want to help her. Maybe it's just work pressure getting to her. You've tried to talk this out? She's barely talking to me at all. When I try, she deflects, then suddenly has things to do. That's not a good sign. How long have things been off like that? I'm not sure. It came on kind of slowly, but at least a year. Maybe it started a year and a half ago. Anything happened then? All I can think of is when she wrecked her car on the ice. She picked up Chinese on her way home from work and hit that hill intersection before they had it salted. Then he gave a little nod. Yeah, I remember that. But it wasn't serious, was it? With a shrug, I proceeded. Some bodywork on the car and a mild concussion, but insurance covered it all. She was a little moody for a couple of days, but what would you expect? Sometimes little things like that make people evaluate their lives. Maybe it scared her more than you think. You think she decided to cheat on me because of a fender bender? He scribbled something on his paper and said, I don't know, but weirder things have happened. We don't even know if she is cheating on you yet. So, a year and a half ago, I'm not sure. I didn't catch it at first. It seems like it's getting worse over the last few months. She's practically stopped talking to me at all. Her business trips used to be months apart before this started. Then it was weeks now. It's a week or two at most. 
Where is she going? Just the North Central region for her office, same as always. Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, and Iowa. Just the big cities. We have a network across the area. It's kind of like a you scratch my back thing. It cuts down on the cost of footwork. A lot of guys owe me favors. That will work. He shifted and drew down his jacket, displaying a huge black handgun. Had to start carrying because of one of those favors. Scanning a bit of hotel security video is pretty simple. I lingered for a while, staring at his computer screen. I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, me too. Caroline was even more aloof throughout the following week, which made me regret involving cash in anything even more. Silence would have ensued if we hadn't spoken at all. I got the impression that she was more interested in observing me than ignoring me. Cash contacted me to meet him at the cafe a few days later. I was taken aback because her next work trip took her to Omaha, which I did not envision as a hub of illegal activity. Missy made sure we were situated in a booth separate from any other patrons. Cash threw a stack of pictures my way and said, I'm sorry, Lee. This stinks, but it appears like you might be right. In the hotel lobby, I beheld a photo of Caroline drooling over a man. Shit. She left with him. Can't be sure where she went, but she didn't get back until three in the morning. Missy leaned over and glanced down at the image, saying, well, that just sucks. Looks more like a random hotel bar hookup than a regular thing. At her, I raised an eyebrow. How the hell can you even tell? For an instant, she cocked her head to look at it. The way she's standing. She doesn't really know this guy. She's fishing for him. A nod from Cash indicated agreement. Yeah, Missy's good at reading body language. That's why I occasionally hire her to watch people. In his direction, Missy furrowed her brow. I thought it was because of my short skirts and long legs. He cast a pitying look up toward the ceiling. I stole a quick look sideways at them. Are you two you know? Missy burst out laughing. Not no, but hell no. On money side. Christ, tell me you're kidding. Both my arms still ache whenever the damn weather changes. Looking back over the photographs, Missy became suddenly more serious. So it's a random hookup and not some steady guy. Probably doesn't make a difference, though, right? I don't see how it would. Money shrugged. I'm going to be in Omaha next week. I'll see if I can find the guy. It kind of looks like he's a regular, maybe a local, from the way he and the bartender seem to know each other. I don't know what difference it could make, but I'll see if I can talk to him. There was no way the guy could persuade me otherwise, but there was also no reason to advise Cash not to investigate. Well, let me know what happens. Then, he gave a little nod. As I walked away, I felt like they were staring at me with pity, though it might have been my imagination. Not that it made a difference. When I wondered how one choose a divorce attorney, I felt plenty of self-pity. After an incredibly discouraging appointment with a divorce attorney and 15 days had passed, Cash contacted me and asked, Is Carolyn around? No. She's in Dayton until next week. I've got a bunch of stuff I want to talk to you about and show you, but I'm running behind on a personal injury claim. I've got to get pics of a demolition site, and then I have to get to the airport. The guy with the supposed back injury is apparently water skiing in Florida. It's short notice bullshit, but it'll be a couple of weeks before I get back, and I think you need to see this now. So what is it? There's a folder on my desk at the office with your name on it. Just take it out to the school at the old Gooseland Superfund site. That's the demo site, where the guy supposedly got hurt. I'll meet you there. And just how am I supposed to get into your office? Shit. I forgot. Just a sec. While he was busy with something, I waited for a moment. Okay, I texted Missy. She has a key and she'll meet you at the office. She could drop off the key. Nah, the office is about halfway between you. It's easier all around if she just meets you there. I arrived at his office 15 minutes later to find Missy, 
dressed in her skimpy club attire, waiting impatiently with an irritated expression on her face. I will be tardy for my appointment, she said as she extended a big brown envelope to me. Her skimpy skirt and revealing top gave me the impression that she was going on a great date with some fortunate man. It would be a belt if that skirt were any shorter. Well, sure. I guess that's the main idea. Plus, I received a set of six pieces of body jewelry. All right then, let's get going so I can start moving. Before I could even say thank you, she had the door secured and was well on her way down the stairs. I hobbled to my car and hopped in, questioning whether it made a difference or whether I was just trying to avoid filing for a while. Just as I was about to start the engine, Missy knocked on the window. Hey, my car won't start. I threw the envelope on the passenger seat and grabbed the ignition. I don't have much time, but I can look at it real quick. Don't bother. It's the alternator. My mechanic said it was about to break down, but it was pricey and had these shoes. So I raised an eyebrow and she shrugged in frustration. No worries. I simply require transportation to Club Electric. I'm confident that I can arrange for a trip back home tomorrow morning. You'll have to wait until I talk to Cash. He's headed to the airport soon, and I have to talk to him. When Missy saw that you were about to argue, she just shrugged and went inside to retrieve the envelope. I'm worth the wait, she said. Oh, I'll just send him in Sam's. We had gone halfway to Gooseland when she began to converse with me instead of texting the guy because her cell service had gone down. Cash claimed to be at the abandoned lead mine. But what exactly was he doing there? Years ago, they shut down that town and emptied it. Claim for injury. Aside from the school, the entire town has vanished. Seems like they're removing it or something. She began to examine the envelope and said, Ugh, you didn't get an opportunity to look inside this. When would the opportunity have presented itself to me? With a cold expression on her face, she asked, Do you mind if I look at it? No, not really, I said after giving it some thought. I doubt it will change anything. Enthusiastically, she tore it open, extracted a thick folder, and started leafing through it. Your whole credit card and cell phone number list that you gave him. He left some notes, but they are unintelligible to me. Despite the caution flags, I continued along the partially overgrown road as Missy perused the folder. Sitting up suddenly, she pursed her lips and wrinkled her nose. Cash has files for like 20 guys in here. How serious is this? When was her sleep period? She remained transfixed, her expressionless face betraying her perplexion. This doesn't make any sense. What is the part that doesn't add up? According to her, maybe he mixed up your stuff with something else. She expressed her uncertainty by shaking her head. Why? Each of these situations involves a missing person. For the past 15 months or so, when I looked over at her, she shrugged and returned to her folder, paging. This individual, however, is the one to whom Cash forwarded that photograph taken on her phone two weeks ago, she said with a hint of reluctance. He appears in a missing person report from last week. We need to ask Cash what the hell is going on. An in-person question is required. As she surveyed the empty landscape, she muttered, Lee, I don't like this. Her cell phone signal was completely dead. Well, we're almost there, so we'll get some answers from Cash, and I'll just go back. I paused as the trees finally cleared, passing through an open gate in a tall fence marked construction zone and keep out. Eventually, we arrived at a long abandoned parking lot in front of a long empty school, a solitary school bus sat rusting alone in the middle of the lot, as if waiting for Mad Max to pass by. I could see Cash's car over by the entrance near the Gooseland School sign. Next to the building, a giant skeleton of the school mascot loomed. The graffiti on the gigantic goose made me look twice. Go, honkers? It sounds like you had quite the football season. Could be worse, Missy said, her voice marked by distraction. Trojans was the mascot of my school. To pull in beside Cash's automobile, I decelerated. 
She gestured me to be quiet as she read quietly to herself. Right when I was about to speak, she began to quickly turn the pages of the folder. No, no, no. What the hell are you talking about? I was pushed into holding the packet by her. The pictures. Jeez, us. The pictures. She struggled to utter a syllable. I moved through them clumsily. They were completely unrelated. Various occupations. Various urban centers. So what? A bunch of different guys. She paused to collect herself. She sounded like she was about to vomit when she said, flip through them. It reminded me of those cartoons I used to make in the margins of my notebooks in elementary school. If you turn the pages in the correct sequence, the bird will fly, the ball will bounce, and the spider will crawl. Alternately, he evolves. As I turn the page, he gradually transformed, become increasingly recognizable. As I watched, he transformed into myself, dyeing one's hair, aspect of the eye. It seemed like every victim was starting to resemble me. The final three felt as familiar as peering into a mirror. I went completely still. What? The. The. Holy. A few seconds later, she spasmodically gulped air. Some of those guys were found dead. Once again, I muddled my way through the file. I. Shit. And unsolved and murder were words that kept popping into my head. That's what I thought. I prayed and said, Jesus Christ. I couldn't even begin to comprehend it. Caroline gets back next week, right? Yeah. Yeah. You can't be here. Not at all. We'll take it to the police. Then you just go. Go somewhere. Go anywhere. A little later, I gave a stupid nod. That's... If Cash had this, what the hell else does he know? Then, she shook her head slowly. It's gotta be real bad. Let's just get whatever the hell Cash has for me and get back to town. He must be inside. Looking back, I don't think it was a particularly wise choice to enter the school. I could make out what appeared to be Cash, slouched on a chair wearing what appeared to be an overcoat, waiting for us in an open classroom just beyond the school office, where the ceiling had entirely collapsed. Missy was still attempting to peruse the file in the waning light as I trailed behind her. When I saw that the body was entirely covered in what appeared to be a blanket, I had to halt in my tracks. While I went steadily forward, Missy stared up from the file, seemingly hypnotized. Whatever was under the blanket wasn't anything we were interested in seeing, and the stench of iron-laden blood was a dead giveaway. I went against my better judgment, reached up and tugged slightly on the blanket. After a few moments, it let go. With a combination of her hands and a pile of folders, Missy suppressed an uncontrollable scream. She then cautiously withdrew till she reached the wall. She exhaled sharply. Holy shit. As Cash dripped blood down his clothing and into the pool beneath the chair, he was handcuffed to the seat. Even with the cloth gag held securely in his mouth, his eyes remained open and lifeless. A second, disgusting mouth formed by the massive incision across his neck. A vile, humorless grin that stretched from ear to ear. What I said was very clear. Okay, this is really bad. Yes. Missy did indeed nod. Time to make a new plan. Yeah, new plan. Run like hell. Suddenly, Caroline's voice sliced through the room, saying, Too late. However, it was flawed in some way. Excessively high. It sounds quavering and frantic. The worst part was that the voice was emanating from the corridor right outside the classroom. Slowly, Caroline came into view. Her hair nearly obscured her face as her head drooped down at a peculiar angle. She was armed with a rifle and a butcher knife. Recoiling at the thought of touching Cash's hanging hand, Missy leaped down from the wall and hurried behind me. Oh, God! Caroline rose from her seat on the floor and met my gaze. Too late. Too late. Too late. The odd, infantile cadence in her voice 
sent shivers down my spine. In my attempt to formulate a response, I raised a hand. Caroline, you betrayed us? You ought not to have peeked. That is not our style of play. You will ruin the game for everyone, she said, as she gently aimed the knife at me. Holy shit. Missy hurled the files toward Caroline, causing a paper snowball effect that blinded her. Run. A gun rang out loudly as Missy shoved me, and I ran for the classroom's side door. Then we veered along the hall and made our way to what had to be an emergency exit. In the brilliant moonlight, we leaped into the air, almost colliding with the massive, deteriorating sculpture of a goose from the biblical end. We hurried across the gravel and weeds to get to the car, and I glanced over my shoulder with a horrified expression. Under no circumstances, the fire door was ajar, and the vast blackness was devoid of Caroline, who I had anticipated to be chasing after us. When I slowed down to jogging, Missy gave me a crazy expression. As she saw what I was staring at, her voice faltered. What are you doing, she? She said. Where is she? I thought she'd be chasing us. Yeah, so did I. Why would she just let us? This probably isn't good, is it? In the deserted lot, I peered about. Could be a little bit wildly, perhaps. Even though Missy and I seemed to be on our own, the moonlight filtering through the trees cast such deep, dark shadows that it was as if there were hordes of Carolines surrounding us. I don't think so. Our next stop was at the vehicle. Shit. I could tell we were in for it the moment we laid eyes on the automobile. Wires dangling from the open hood caught my eye. It was certainly something I could remedy with some time, but I didn't think I would ever have that luxury. Missy was in shock as she asked, Didn't you lock it? Sure I did. But you know she has keys to it, right? Apologies? I failed to consider that. Missy extended her arm and made a half-hearted effort to pull Cash's door doorknob. It was obviously locked. Slowly, the school's front door swung open, creaking. Just hearing Caroline say, isn't this game fun, made my blood run cold. Missy and I dashed around the corner to the far side of the campus without uttering a word. As we round the bend, Missy lost her footing. In order to prevent her from falling, I grasped her hand. Be careful. Her intense gaze was locked on me. Easy for you to say. If I'd known what was gonna happen, I wouldn't be dressed like the dumb-ass bimbo who dies five minutes into the damn movie. Really? She shot me a look of pure frustration. I'd at least have worn running shoes. Had I known it wouldn't break us both, I would have laughed. When things went wrong, Missy did what she always did. Use less amusing humor. We found a way around a sign that identified the pile of decaying wood and metal behind it as the Gooseland 4 Greenhouse for a Better Greenhouse for a Better Greener America and set out to explore it. Where are we going? Hell if I know. The last gas station I saw was almost 20 miles back. As Missy cautiously made her way across the wreckage, someone asked, Did you know she had a gun? I'm pretty sure that was Cash's gun. Missy began to look over to me, as if to say something as we crossed the threshold of the greenhouse. Just in front of us, Caroline emerged from the building's shadow. It was clear that she had only recently returned to the school. She seemed strangely childlike in her voice. You know, you aren't very good at this game. It would probably be harder for me if you would, you know. Just stop talking. Caroline drew near me, leaving me with no other option, as Missy emitted a noise that sounded remarkably like meep and dashed to the right. As quickly as possible, I turned around and stomped my way back through the chaos. From behind me, eerie laughter echoed through the shadows. I noticed a partially open door the moment I emerged from the greenhouse's debris. I ducked down and paused to allow my eyes to adapt. The ceiling had given in to the elements, leaving behind a pitch-black room with slashes of silver-white moonlight. I cautiously made my way through the nightmare corridors, seeking an exit. There appeared to be bottomless pits in the floor and collapsed ceilings all throughout the place. 
I made the wrong decision after seeing a brilliant square of moonlight that led me to an exit to the outside. I was hopelessly obstructed by a sort of thick wire fencing that stood in the way of the entrance. I retreated. No way out, is there? The individual's speech was strange and rhythmic, with a focus on the incorrect syllables. As I made my way back into the hall, Caroline watched me with an air of unabashed delight. Gradually, I retreated. Look, Caroline. Slowly and deliberately, she moved forward, her hold on the knife altering as the silvery moonlight reflected off its blade. I was about to add something else, but her expression, a mix of blankness and confusion, made it clear that she wasn't paying attention. I realized I wouldn't be able to defeat her when she raised her rifle to shoot me. I was tripping over rubble as I dashed down the closest corridor. In my mind, she was about to open fire on me, but that never happened. I nearly panicked and sprang to my feet after falling flat on my face. Under no circumstances. Stand still. Complete silence. Under no circumstances. I dove headfirst into the wall, using my sense of touch to navigate through the dark. It sounded like an avalanche every time my foot scraped the ground. The sound of my own breathing was almost overpowered by the pounding of my own heartbeat. Leaning around what felt like a door frame, I discovered a vast, empty room bordered by slashes of light and darkness. With the floor evidently pulled out and the ceiling caved in, I couldn't tell if it had been a cafeteria or a gymnasium. Moving from one floor support beam to another while clinging to rubble required my undivided attention. It ended up being too much. After I almost lost my hold and fell off a beam, I took a moment to collect myself and breathe. From up ahead of me came a faint, gentle laugh. Retrieve her from the shadows required some time. A glimmer of movement. She was creeping closer to me at a rate I could never have imagined. Moonlight reflecting off her knife's blade made her seem like she was bouncing from one beam to the next. Ten feet distant, she came to a complete halt, her balance impeccable on a broken beam that I would never have dreamed of putting my weight on. I believed she was making a sound, but it was really simply a series of unaccompanied, seemingly random humming noises. Caroline, let's talk about this. Like an insect nibbling on flesh, her face moved. But that's not how it's supposed to be done. You have to hush. We can't let anyone hear, remember? After that, she sprang onto the beam where I was standing. Her smile was as lifeless as a corpse. She approached cautiously, like a cat pursuing a mouse in its snare. After that, she disappeared, and I started to plummet. Almost silently, the beam had collapsed, plunging her into the pitch black below. As she descended, the room's debris shattered, causing a deafening crash. For all my worth, I clung to a thick loop of wire or something similar. Even though I was in excruciating pain from hitting my skull on a beam, I could barely make out one of her hands jutting out from behind the debris. It was the hand that was still holding the knife. I mustered all my strength to reach the next beam, and then the one after that. Once I crossed over, I attempted to turn around, but the moonlight had changed the shadows so much that I couldn't see her hand. I eventually made it out into the open after stumbling my way through the halls. Missy. Before we met at the school, I thought Caroline had little chance of catching up to Missy. Missy. A figure jolted out from around the building's corner, and I let out a breath of relief, knowing that Missy was safe. As soon as the thing emerged into the light, a maniacal grin spreading over its face, I bolted for the parking lot. I swerved around the concrete mascot and dashed into the parking lot, with Caroline persistently after me. I slammed my face, first on the gravel a few seconds after that. The parking blocks were concealed by low undergrowth. I began to scuttle past the corroded wreckage of the school bus. It certainly didn't sound like Caroline when she yelled, Hop on the bus! And I had no other choice. With something sticky sticking to my left palm, I slithered up the steps into the deserted bus. While Missy squatted in the center aisle, I swooped up to her level. What are you doing in here? 
Why didn't you run away? Everything is surrounded by a huge fence with barbed wire. And the gates are closed? There is nowhere else to go. Exactly how does this help? Perplexed, Missy shrugged. It has to be better than being out there with her. Right. Near the front of the bus, we both heard a strange noise. Like something dragging on gravel that made us both stop moving. The emergency exit was just partially open. So I reached over and gently guided Missy in that direction. While she was pausing, I leaned in close enough to say something into her ear. If she starts to come in, just slip out the back. We slithered back toward the rear. I was hyper-focused due to flashbacks of Cash's body, even though Missy's short skirt would have been a major distraction in other settings. I was on the edge of my seat when I heard a metallic scrape coming from behind the bus. Lee, I know you're in there. You and your little skank. Missy tensed up and sent an angry look at the person speaking. Her enraged expression was plain to read, yet I gestured for her to be quiet nevertheless. I thought a little slurs would be the smallest of our issues. A harsh, growing din of metal clanging on metal pierced the air. There's always a little skank, isn't there? Evidently, she was aware of our whereabouts. I had to bide my time until I could come up with a plan of action. Caroline, you know I wouldn't do that to you. Missy is just trying to help. We're worried about you. The sound of a jay's call sounded like a loud laugh, she said. I'll bet. I've been watching you. That's how I knew about Richard. I'm always watching you. I know you haven't done anything, but you will. Her voice faded, then returned with a sharper and slightly childlike tone. You always do, Frank. Caroline. Listen. This is Lee. In the vicinity of the entrance resounded an awful screech, as if ripping metal. Shut up. Shut up. I know who you are, Frank. I know. The outburst shocked Missy to her core, and she remained wide awake. Caroline didn't get a chance to speak before the head of the bus climbed the stairway. Despite her hair cascading like Spanish moss across her face, her white eyes shone through the moonlight. That smile, though too broad and garish to have been created by a human. As her knife raised to point at us, shards of glass scuttled over the floor. I see you. Go! Missy pounded on the rear door with all her might, prying it open just enough for her to collapse to the floor and bolt. I chased after her, attempting to go to the school and take cover there, as the sound of a gunshot echoed from behind me. My hip was suddenly struck, sending me flying forward and almost sending me down. I attempted to stagger ahead, but my uncoordinated gait caused me to trip over another curb block, sending me careening into the partially crumbled concrete geese sculpture's base. My right hand hit one of the rebar spikes protruding from the base of the sculpture, and I backed away, oddly relieved that I hadn't hit my head again. I felt a painful knot in my gut as I pushed off. The dreadful sensation of rebar vibrating down my hand's bones. My legs were just not cooperating, so I rolled away while retching a little. An internal voice warned me that the hand wound and the hip shot would cause excruciating pain in the days to come. It wouldn't be an issue, as pointed out by a louder, less nice voice. Eventually, there would be no later. Caroline crossed the parking lot and made her way over to me while humming and mumbling something that sounded like fragments of nursery rhymes and an unusual sing-song of jumbled sentences. For a split second, it was as if she had completely forgotten who I was. A misaligned grin crept up over time. Lee, it breaks my heart to see you hurting. But I, I can help. Her expression turned gloomy, and her smile turned into a line that was devoid of humor. Her voice quivered and trembled as she said, Can't I? I can always make you better. Sliding the revolver into the back pocket of her trousers, Caroline shook her head in disapproval. As she raised the blade of the knife, she beheld the moonlight shimmering along its edge. This is more appropriate, don't you think? More. Intimate. 
After all, we've done to each other. I don't know why you won't just stay dead, Frank. Wouldn't that be easier? Hey, you. I was able to meet Caroline's intense stare as she lifted her head to look up. At the entrance to the school, Missy stood. She stood resolutely, spitting Caroline off with both hands, despite her obviously terrified expression and trembling voice. You're gonna let the skank get away? I have all night to hunt you down, Missy. Besides, this isn't about you. It's never been about the skanks. It's about him. It's about making this stop. Jesus, you're completely insane, Missy partly said as she stepped out into the moonlight. Strangely, Caroline twitched and stared at her without budge. Stop. Bat shit. I said stop. Under her breath, Missy said, Looney Tunes. Caroline caught her eye as she crossed her arms. Stop. Whack job. No wonder you can't keep a man. Anger contorted Caroline's features. I said, stop. Missy pushed her tongue out in a juvenile manner and said, Coo, coo cocoa puffs. You're a nut job. Freak. Perhaps the insults were the problem. It might have been the tongue, but I could practically hear Caroline lash out. She pulled the pistol from her pocket and let out an illogical scream before aimlessly shooting at the spot where Missy had been standing. I looked around for a grip, but all I could find was broken stone. I snatched a sculpture about the size of a ball the second the gun went off. Caroline, her face contorted with anger and frustration, jerked her attention away from the doorway, which was now deserted, and squared her eyes on me. She adjusted the knife in her hand and approached me, her voice barely audible as she mumbled and grumbled. My smack of the concrete block on her foot coincided with her snarl and the raising of the knife. If I could inflict enough pain on Caroline's foot, Missy might be able to escape, but I couldn't. Caroline jumped and twisted away, howling in agony. She stumbled backward, landed flat next to me, and then went completely silent as she walked on loose pieces of pavement. My twisted hand wailed in agony as I attempted to crawl, and my legs continued to feel off. She remained motionless, despite a little quiver and the tapping of her right heel on the floor. Perhaps a concussion had struck her. I dragged my legs behind me as I weakly drew myself closer to her, using my one strong arm. No matter what, I had to put a stop to this and stop her. I just didn't know how. She would relentlessly murder without mercy. From the middle of her chest, three prongs of bar protruded. Her wide, watery eyes made it impossible for me to discern whether she was seeing me. She emitted a melancholy, distressed cry. And for an instant, I could perceive the familiar and beloved Caroline. I was able to submerge her head with my strong arm. It ended when she shivered. She was completely lifeless in my hands. I began to feel weak and dizzy. It might have been little more than a final gasp as her vision faded. And yet, I had the distinct impression that she said a final phrase in a whisper. I tried very hard to make out one last word. Daddy? After a whole month, ready to go home? I cautiously settled into the driver's seat. My hip hurt from sitting in economy class. Yeah, thanks for the ride. As Missy fiddled with the AC for a while, she gave a nod. After Cash's funeral, most of the bruises that had covered her had faded. I figured you might want a hand getting home. You could have just dropped off the key at the service desk. That would be discouraging. Anyway, your vehicle still stinks. If you don't change the passenger seat, it will always smell bad. Approximately one quart of your blood went into it as I was removing you from that location. I groaned with regret. No detailing is that good. You still owe me for the skirt and crop top, you know. My reaction was to snort. The soul means that Missy's disposal for halting the bleeding had been exhausted. Five of each. I'll purchase for you. I really recommend it. If you let a steamy nude woman drag you into the emergency room, you'll skip the line altogether. I ended up with phone numbers for three paramedics, two nurses, and an anesthesiologist. A smug grin spread across her face. 
I'm not surprised. Even as out of it as I was, I saw how much attention you were getting from the guys there. Getting me a robe did take a little longer than expected. Women, however, were the callers of three of the numbers. Really? Missy waved her hand indifferently. Listen, there's no need to pass judgment. On a Friday night, my odds of getting a date are doubled. Until she escorted us out of the parking lot, we remained quiet for an extended period of time. You know the police probably left your place a mess. Things were already a racket. While I was in the hospital for four days, they tore it to shreds. They resorted to searching it, after realizing that Cash was likely correct regarding her trips. It's a disastrous mess. How many guys do they think she killed? They seem to be sure of at least 15 victims, but they're trying to use her to clear every missing guy in the region between 20 and 50. Missy froze. I heard they found all kinds of video cameras in your house. They numbered 10. On addition to the GPS tracker on my vehicle, they uncovered an app on my phone that sent and recorded all of my texts and phone calls and sent them to her. She never let her eyes off of me. She trembled. So glad I refrained from sending you any naked selfies. About 15 months ago, on a particular night, I nearly did. My desire to flaunt my piercings was fueled by my intoxication and foolishness. I accidentally forwarded them to the incorrect number while trying to be humorous. Leanne, my cousin, still gets a flush every time we have a conversation. She awkwardly shrugged. So what did you find in Des Moines? Nearly half of her story was untrue. By the time she was 13 years old, her parents had perished in a mysterious house fire. I was unable to obtain her medical records throughout her two years in a mental institution. That's not much for almost five weeks of looking. It was Cash, not me, who was the expert. Nonetheless, I believe I uncovered the necessary information. What was that? Her step. Father's name wasn't Keith like she told me. For a brief moment, I closed my eyes. Frank, was it? It was also alleged that he had abused some young women. Oh! Missy gazed unwaveringly ahead at the road ahead. I see. You know, he passed away before charges were even filed against him. Her gaze remained fixed on the roadway. Did he? He looked like you, didn't he? My response was a nod, and I felt an internal cringe. Almost uncannily, Frank resembled me. For the next few minutes, we remained silent until we finally arrived at the house. The door was still adorned with the disorganized ribbons of yellow police tape. Missy tightened her jawline. You really ready to go back in there? Not really. I'm still having nightmares, but I need to sooner or later, and where the hell else? Into gear, she pushed the automobile. Then later on, my house is available for you to stay for a bit. Hi there. This isn't necessary for you to do. You're not the only one waking up in a cold sweat, Lee. Yes, I gave it some thought. You still have that old couch? Forget it. I splurged on a superior one. Good. That thing was uncomfortable as hell. Before Missy could finish her thought, she froze. Lee, you're aware that things will improve. You will overcome this and find love in due time. I'm not exactly batting a thousand here. Despite her best efforts, she couldn't help but burst into laughing. Your ability to identify women has truly declined. We must locate a course or guidebook for you, God. Perhaps there is a database that categorizes escort girls. I don't think there's anything like that out there. We'll check Amazon. They have everything. Her smile broadened. We skidded to a halt outside her apartment complex. Missy merely jumped out and yanked open my door as I sat there for a moment. Come on, let's get your bags. Uncomfortably, I began to stand up. My hip is still sore. Standing up was made easier for me by Missy. I can't believe she shot you in the butt. The hip. Just tell the other people what you want. The bleeding had to be stopped. With all the garments I wore. She hit you square in the face. 
We scrambled up to the structure. I climbed the two flights of stairs and patiently waited for her to retrieve her key so she could open the door. Two simple chairs and a coffee table flanking the television were my first observations upon entering. But other than that, I didn't see a thing. I thought you said you had a new couch. Truly, I was dishonest. Everybody knows I do that. We couldn't possibly assist one other in dealing with nightmares if we were separated, would we? This isn't really a good idea. I felt a sudden snatching of my hand by Missy. Let's go, Lee. Once again, I will bring a grin to your face. We will help you mount up again. The most effective treatment option for you. I have some fresh abilities to share with you. My hip. Trust me when I say that the agony will completely fade from your mind. Listen, madam. I am truly grateful for all that you have accomplished. Every single thing. If it were up to you, there's no way we could have survived. Just how bad is it? In your mind. She started laughing out loud. I know you, Lee. Come on. I refuse to be anyone's ideal Miss Wright. I would rather not be. Everyone here knows that I would stink at it. Even when I gave in and walked a little distance, she was clearly still dragging me toward the bedroom. Why? I may not be Miss Wright, but I am Miss Wright here right now. In one seemingly impossible action, she slipped her jean shorts and t-shirt off, releasing my hand just in time. Her tongue stud complimented her other piercings and earrings, so she paused to show them to me. I couldn't help but notice her bubble. Gum, pink underwear, and thought of the six-piece set of body jewelry that she had described. She pulled me back into motion while sporting a really devious grin and raised one eyebrow wickedly. She flashed me a garish smile after a short pause. I'm going to be the most awesome rebound girl in the entire history of rebound girls. A smile spread across my face as a result. Later. When you're ready for her, I'll help you find Miss Wright. Her laughter was melodic. I swear to God, I will find you the best Miss Wright ever. She abruptly ended my attempt to express my disapproval of how absurd that sounded. We should probably both get some rest on this one tonight. You will start to see the light in the morning, I promise you. Afterwards, she planted a passionate kiss on my lips. Something about the combination of cinnamon and carefree heat was just right. It dawned on me that she was likely correct.